Good evening. <laughs> Says I'm not the only one who's had the clap from Lisa tonight. Hey. <laughs> Does that include fat? <laughs> That's your ten pound right now. Anyway, let's not talk about blowings because I'm from Brighton. Let's leave it there. <laughs> now, originally, uh, good evening. My name's Mark. I um, I live in Cornwall now. <laughs> Get off your sister. Yeah. Um, I live in a small village called 1976. <laughs> It's true, it's so backward. It's so backward. When the neighbours come round, I have to turn the colour off the telly. Or <laughs> <laughs> I'll send a piece of wife of witchcraft. <laughs> Again? I could have stood up for her, really, but I honestly thought she could swim. But, um... <laughs> Are you the ones that have been married about a year? Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's all right, I've been married five happy years. And 17 miserable fuckers. <laughs> We got to the stage in our life where you just start around because you can, you know what I mean? It starts off gentle, you know, where you say, what do you fucking mark there, Vaughn? You know, and now we progress to, you know, I go shopping with her and she comes out, she says, oh, does this dress make you look fat? No, no, the dress is fine. She asks some stomach to make you look fat. <laughs> and I've, uh, I've got two teenage daughters, proper teenagers, they are proper teenagers. They, uh, they got this wonderful act of, they can sing the words to every song on the radio in the car. It's fantastic, they know the words to every song, I mean every song. The DJ comes on and says, this is a world exclusive, first play ever. And they know all the words, it's marvellous. He could say, this is the German Eurovision Song Contest entry. And they know it, they're like, click me, click me, do me, do me. And they're there. Now my wife, my wife is trying to hang on to her youth. So she does the same. She thinks she knows all the words to all the songs. She don't know many songs. She don't know many words. So to make up for this, she mumbles the words that she don't know, and she emphasises the words that she do. Take that, always torture. Come on the radio show, all like this one. Turns it up, it comes on. She's on. Like, patience! <laughs> <laughs> and you realise then, my God, I'm getting old. <laughs> but you really, I mean, to be honest with you, I know I'm getting old, because every Christmas I know I'm getting older, because you start smelling a bit. <laughs> well, I must do, because everybody gives me shower gel. <laughs> I've got to that age, you know, and if I'm honest, I've become that relative that you don't want to buy a present for. <laughs> yeah? Get him this one, it's in a box, it looks more, you know what I mean? <laughs> I say that they don't want to buy me a present, I've become the, I've become the free one in a free for two. <laughs> or Links Africa is it's commercially known. <laughs> and then mate, what happens is, a few years down the line, she gets a present, but your name goes on it too. <laughs> they call it a shared gift. And then somebody will give it to you in front of you. And she'll say, oh, go on, open it. It's for us, it's got your name on it, it's got both of us. And then you have to pretend you like it, say, oh, thanks very much. Just what I wanted, a half share and a bottle of chili infused oil. <laughs> That's how it worked. But this Christmas just gone, things took a lot. Things went really bad and I realised how old I'd got. Because I got my first ever gift card for a garden centre. <laughs> They might as well have got me a card that when you open it, a boot comes out, keep you straight in the bottom. <laughs> oh, I had the raving up. I had the up for months. Of course, my missus gets a, she gets a gift card for Next and she's happy. She phones them up. Oh, thank you very much for my gift card from Next. I'm really happy, thank you. And Mark says thank you for his gift card for the garden centre. I fucking didn't. <laughs> And then, she says, the girls will send you their thank you letters in due course. Yeah, of course they will, just before their birthday. <laughs> but what I love living in Cornwall, I'm getting all tangled up here, I do apologise. What I do love about living in Cornwall is nobody gives a shit about anything. <laughs> nobody cares. If you want to know anything, you've got to find out for yourself. 
Now, a couple of years ago, I had an accident, I hurt my back. Cut. Boy, they said they were slow in Thomas there, they weren't wrong, was they? <laughs> but I only had to go for physiotherapy. Doctor said, I'm going to send you for physiotherapy, you're going to have to go to the hospital. I thought, oh no, this is a nightmare, we have to go to Plymouth. Because I'm used to like big city hospitals, big departments, whole buildings up on departments, you know what I mean? He said, no, 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 you just go to the local cottage hospital. It's fine, they have a physiotherapy clinic there on a Tuesday. Marvellous, so I went there, free parking, lovely. It's a little place. But what I didn't realise is some of the facilities are shared. All right? They don't tell me this, you find out for yourself. They said, there's a the waiting room now. So I went into the waiting room of the physiotherapy department, which I then found out was the waiting room for the sexual health clinic. <laughs> First thing I knew, there was a picture on the wall. Does your penis look like this? <laughs> I can honestly say it didn't because the broken picture was black. <laughs> and then you're standing around, you're standing there, and you're thinking, you're thinking, I hope no one recognises me. I hope no one recognises me. But it's horrible because everybody thinks you've got a disease, you know. Then you this young kid he comes in, he's about 17, right? 17, he's got a sexual disease, wants everybody to know about it. He stood there strumming himself. And I don't know how to describe him. He had trainers on, big baggy tracksuit bottoms, a hoodie. Cap on back to front. Gangster rapper, I suppose. But he came from Cornwall, didn't he? So he's more ginster rapper, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, then... <laughs> and then what summed up Cornwall to me, a treat, about how nobody cares. These two porters came in, these two local blokes. Didn't care about anything. And they wheeled in a lady in a wheelchair, she must have been 90. Obviously there for physiotherapy. If she was there for a sexual health problem, fair play to her. <laughs> but these blokes just didn't care. They did not care. They just left this poor 90-year-old woman in a wheelchair, sat under a poster that simply read, this is what gonorrhea looks like. <laughs> so I moved to Cornwall about five years ago. People from back home said, oh, you're gonna find it difficult. They won't like you, they're not very friendly. You'll struggle to get a job. They don't like giving their jobs to guys, people from the outside. Load of rubbish. Really, really friendly. From day one, they started calling me Grant. Affectionately calling me Grant, making me feel welcome. Grant, because obviously, sound a bit, look a bit like Grant Mitchell. Yeah. <laughs> Found out yesterday, Grant, short for him Grant, they don't like me at all. <laughs> but everybody in Cornwall is so lazy. They really are lazy. I've, I've, I've become it myself. But like, the companies have recognised and they've introduced this scheme where you can have as much time off work as you want, but you have to invest in a scheme called credit sticks. Now, have you got credit sticks in Somerset? Okay, okay, it's, it's, it's in I didn't know about it until I got the call, more admittedly. What you do is if you want time off work, you invest in this scheme called credit sticks, you can do it as a single person or as part of a syndicate. And then when you want 10 minutes off work, you physically cash in a credit stick, and what you do is you take one, you go outside, you set fire to it, blow smoke out of it. <laughs> And this entitles you to 10 minutes off work, apparently. <laughs> and then you all just stand in a circle and moan about the people still working. <laughs> now, a little while ago, I was feeling a bit tired, and I saw my mate Terry going outside for one. I said, oh, Terry, I wish I was part of the scheme. I'd like 10 minutes off work. He said, come outside. He said, I'll treat you. <laughs> now, the irony was I wanted 10 minutes off work. This thing made me so fucking sick, I had the rest of the day off. <laughs> so a few of us got talking, and we said, why are they allowed to go outside just because they've got this filthy habit? And we're not allowed. Yeah. 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 Right yeah. yeah. Oh, we're preaching. <laughs> so a few of us got together and said, we know we're going to form our own credit stick union with Kit Kats. <laughs> so the next day, all the smokers went outside. Half a dozen of us went outside with Kit Kats. We formed our own circle. <laughs> we had one finger each. <laughs> And we stood there sucking the chocolate off the wafer. <laughs> After 10 minutes, you're just left with a wafer which you throw on the floor and stab on it, <laughs> push it into a wall, or for a bit of banter, you flick it. <laughs> and we did this for weeks, but the similarities start straight away because it's only a few days in and the same bloke comes outside and says, I've left my Kit Kats in my jacket, no money off. Come back at 48, tried to sell them off cheap. 
Hãy cùng à, mít mà sổ vào cái này Có quen mít phụ phụ phúc nói And then maybe I'm a little bit naive But it's a Rastafarian fellow Patrick And his Kit Kats always smell a little bit more exotic than everybody else But then one day HR got wind of it and just put a stop to it for no reason at all They just put a stop to it there and then But that was the day they called me at the desk and I'd sat there for half hour with some ice cream wafers, a bar of galaxy, trying to roll my own kick ass. <laughs> well, I'd heard it was cheaper, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, you know, we talk about work, and like many of, well, many of you people, I went to work yesterday, okay? When I work, I have a routine, all right? My routine is, as soon as I get to work, I put the kettle on, all right? Because everybody's entitled to a cup of tea in the morning, am I right? Yes. And yesterday when I got there, there was Mick. Mick was the only one there. Now, Mick's got a routine. He buys a paper on his way to work, and he reads it in work time. So what I do is I make him a drink, and I creep up behind it, and I smack the drink down in the middle of his paper. Bosh! And it spills everywhere. And when he looks at me, I say, Mick, I'll make you a drink. And Mick now knows he's got a drink, and Mick knows I've made it. It's a simple but effective communication technique. I then go and hide in the kitchen, and as the others come in, I'm on it straight away. Drink, bosh, drink, bosh, drink, bosh. Obviously, I don't call them all Mick. Because <laughs> that would be silly. And if they're Irish, it's slightly offensive. <laughs> we all it. And then when the first half does it or so, we're going to make more the second round of drinks whether they want it or not. And then that's what done, because no one should have to make more than two rounds of drinks in any one working day, am I right? Yeah. And then if a latecomer comes in and says, Oh, Mark never makes a drink, then he puts them straight. He says, Oh, you're right. He's maybe two already. You weren't here. Why is your neck in? And harmony is restored to the workplace. <laughs> but yesterday, people, something happened, something changed, and I'm going to share this with you. Because it got to about two o'clock, and I was feeling a bit. <laughs> so I started looking around the office, you ain't made a drink. There's 20 people where I work, and I ain't had 20 drinks. <laughs> I suddenly see Janet walking towards the kitchen. But she's hiding her cup behind her like this. <laughs> I'm thinking, aye, aye, Janet's making the crafty one for herself. <laughs> I'll have to suddenly grab her attention. So what I did was I stood up and I went, Oh, damn it! Damn it, man! She turned around, she looked at me, she said, oh, I'm not making one. I'm going to the dentist. I'm just washing my cup. And if I'm honest, I looked a little bit silly. But what I did do, people, was draw attention to the fact that the two o'clock round of drinks was imminent. Because the two o'clock round of drinks is the most important of any one working day. Because for many people, it's the last one of the working day. So no one wants to miss it. But consequently, no one wants to make it. <laughs> so I started looking around the office, who was going to offer to make a drink, and everybody was looking at me. Some of them were even dangling their mugs on the end of their fingers in my direction. <laughs> I got animated, I got agitated, I frustrated, it all came out in anger. <laughs> it's fair to say I was suffering from beverage rage. <laughs> or as it's more fashionably known, beverage. <laughs> but I didn't quarrel, I didn't argue, I didn't cry. I manned up, I picked up the tray, and I walked around the office and I collected the 20 monks for this mammoth and unprecedented third round of drinks. And it led me to a discovery, people. A discovery that I'm going to share with you people tonight. I learned that the whole of modern society could be placed into various groups of categories based upon their beverage drinking habits and consumptions. You will recognise some of your friends, family, colleagues, and even yourselves as being members of these groups. Some of your relationships may never be the same again. <laughs> Strap yourselves in, you get uncomfortable. <laughs> now the first group of people are people like myself, completely bloody normal. <laughs> Everybody wants to be like me, of course you do, why would you? <laughs> now before we go any further, I don't know if you know Tony, but he only drinks hot water. So we'll leave him out of this if you don't mind, he's no trouble. But this in itself brings conflict and ambiguity into the workplace, because you get all the left wings Vegetarian hipster social worker types who only drink fruit tea. <laughs> just face it, it's just squash for grown ups. <laughs> they say, oh, it's just the same. It's just the same, you've only got to put a bag in it. And you say, look, I do see where you're coming from. You make a very good point. But at the end of the day, that involves infusion. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> now, the biggest group of people, the biggest group are the people that always say yes to a drink. Yeah? Always say yes. Wouldn't know how to say no. These are the people that when you ask me if they want a drink, they will drink a red hot drink, burning their tonsils, just so they can have enough fun. These are the people that run back to their desk, pick up their mugs. These are the people, when you got the train, they run alongside you and say, oh, just made it. These people always, always take one, but they never, ever make one. Yeah? Always take one, never make one. Now these people are called arsehoes. <laughs> There's many of them, 
Some of them even aggravate the fact, because not only do they always take one and never make one, just as he's adding in his mug, he says, oh, I was just about to make one. <laughs> now, he knows he wasn't going to make one. You know he wasn't going to make one. He knows you know he wasn't going to make one, but he still says it. Proper answer. Yeah. Now, we can convert these people. We can make them normal. But I have to warn you, there's more of them than there are of us. You can't take them all on at once. You get yourself into trouble. So the best way to do this is if you imagine all the arseholes and gazelles grazing on the world savannah. You are the lone lion hunting your prey. You've got one chance to get this right. So you have to pick on the weakest and most vulnerable member of the group. Obviously, don't pick on the same group all the time and get done for bullying and harassment. But this is what you do. If he takes sugar, you don't give him any sugar. If he don't take sugar, you give him loads of sugar. And if he don't take milk, you give him so much milk, he thinks he's got a cup of Horlicks. And then what you do is you hand the drinks out, and halfway round, you pass him his drink, and you move away. Come in. And you move away. Before long, you'll take a sip and you'll say, I don't take sugar. And you say, oh, I'm ever so sorry. My mistake. And then when it all goes quiet, you say, You know what you want to yourself! Yeah. He'll make the next one. Don't worry about that. <laughs> now, in every office, there's a prick that don't drink tea or coffee but gets upset if you don't ask him. <laughs> Call in my office. His name's Andrew. Not allowed to call him Andy. Sums him up in Tarby. <laughs> he went to HR and complained about me. He said, I'd like to complain about Mum. When he makes a tea or coffee in the morning, he doesn't ask me if I want a tea or coffee in the morning. Even though I don't drink tea or coffee, I'd like to be asked if I want a tea or coffee because he asks everybody else if they want a tea or coffee. So therefore, I'd like to be asked if I want a tea or coffee because I want to feel like everybody else. <laughs> HR took me into a meeting. They said, we've had a complaint from Andrew. Two things. Stop calling him Andy. He don't like it. <laughs> Secondly, when you make a tea or coffee in the morning, you must ask Andrew if he wants a tea or coffee in the morning because you ask everybody else if they want a tea or coffee in the morning. Andrew feels left out, bullied by exclusion because you don't ask me if he wants a tea or coffee. So therefore, you must ask if he wants a tea or coffee or you will get disciplined. So now every morning we have to play out this charade and say, hello Andrew, would you like a tea or coffee this morning? And he says, no thank you Mark, I don't drink tea or coffee, but he feels like everybody else. <laughs> yeah, just to make sure he feels like everybody else, I charge him four pound a month for the privilege. <laughs> now the last group of people I'm going to talk about is a little bit sensitive, because there's a split in this group and it's one agenda. These are the people that will not give you a straight answer. Yeah. You ask a woman in this group if you'd she like a drink, you don't get an answer. You get this, you say, hello love, would you like a drink? She says, oh, oh, I would quite like one, but I don't think I should have one. <laughs> but I haven't had one since lunch. If I don't have one now, I won't have one till I get home. But if I do have one now, I should want one when I'm on the bus. But if I don't want one, I might want a wee before I get home. What's worse, I want a wee when I'm on the bus. Oh, Marjorie's having one, Brenda's having one. Yes, please, I think I'll have one. <laughs> Biscuit or anything else, just, just keep it. But the blokes are worse. The blokes are worse because you get the bloke who thinks it's a trick question. You say, hello mate, would you like a drink? Well, only if you make him one. What's he think? Some fucking nothing goes around the office. Want a drink? Want a drink? Want a drink? I'm not making one. Bang! <laughs> but the bloke who really makes my shit itch <laughs> is the bloke who answers you cryptically. Your name. You say, do you want a drink, mate? Oh, I wouldn't say no. Well, say fucking yes, then. Hey, give it a drink. I mean, only in the consumption of hot beverages, this is done. I wouldn't say no, even deemed acceptable. In any moment, night, his wife says, can I have a lift of bingo? I wouldn't say no. Have you let the cat out? I wouldn't say no. He don't go to watch football on a Saturday afternoon with his mates when his team scored. They don't all jump up and go, I wouldn't say no. <laughs> Now, when they mucky movies of you, seen where she's reaching a point of orgasm, shout out, I wouldn't say no, I wouldn't say no. <laughs> it don't happen, does it? So, ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to take one thing away with you tonight, let it be this. When you go to work next week, don't be an arsehole. <laughs> Put the cat on, because if you're going to take one, you should make one. My name's Mark Dennett, thanks for listening. Good night.
reception. So again, get enough drinks to see you through the rest of the night. The food bank might just still be outside, and we'll meet you back here in about 15 minutes. You're fantastic. Headliner. One more time, Mark Dennett. Yeah.